I'm very, very happy to have Carlo Cottarelli here, a former colleague from the IMF for, for many years. Um, Carlo's first degree was from the University of Siena, and then he has a master's from the LSE, and then went to the Banca d'Italia and ENI, and then went to the IMF in 87, where we interacted repeatedly over the decades. Um, and uh, you were in the monetary department in its various names, fiscal department, the um, the European, European department, department and the, I mean, whatever, the strategy <laughs> the department, strategy department. Um, ending up as, as director of the fiscal department. Um, and then, then went as uh, expenditure commissioner extraordinaire um, to Italy um, for, in, in 2013. And at present is the, um, the IMF executive director for Italy, Greece, Albania, Cyprus. Uh, Malta. Malta. San Marino. So, and San Marino. And Portugal. So, so San Marino and, and the Portuguese uh, represented by Carlo here. And anyway, we go straight on to Carlo. I, yeah, I mean, the, the, if you talk for whatever, uh, maybe an hour or so. Yeah. And then we have a question and answer. Okay. Amongst everybody. Great. Uh, Charles, thanks a lot. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Uh, it's an honor for me. To, go, to come back to, to Oxford uh, and to be here. Um, the, what I'll do today is uh, to present uh, a preview of this book, uh, What We Owe, that is uh, Truth, Myths and Lies About Public Debt, uh, that uh, will be published uh, by Brookings uh, in early September in Washington. And um, you should know that this is uh, Two-thirds of this book is simply the translation of a book that I wrote last year in Italy uh, about public debt, public debt in Italy. One-third talks about other countries. So it's not a book on Italy, this one, but it's a book about all advanced uh, economies. I wrote uh, the first book uh, about Italy, um, because, and, and this translation in a way is also, in this version of the book, uh, is also motivated by the same uh, reason because I felt that uh, people were not talking enough, including at the IMF, were not talking enough about uh, the risks arising from living, from, from, from living with, uh, with the public debt to GDP ratio that, was, uh, that is, in my view, too high. I'm not too hawkish about these issues. I don't think that there are people who believe that any public debt is bad. I don't think so public debt becomes a problem when uh, it is too large. And I think at the moment, at least in some countries, Italy is one of them, public debt as a ratio of GDP, as a ratio of, of the economy, is, is too large. Now, in a way, the way to start, and, and this book is, of course, it's not a book for, it's not a technical book. It's uh, a book that I hope everybody will be able to read. The starting point for me is this, uh, this chart. This is the history uh, since uh, 1880 uh, until now of the public debt to GDP ratio. What does this uh, uh, chart uh, show us? This is for advanced economies. Um, this is the period before the First World War when there was a trend decline in, in the public debt to GDP ratio. In history, big increases in public debt are related essentially to wars. Uh, you don't see this because it comes early, but you may know that during the Napoleonic War, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, public debt uh, skyrocketed in, in this country. So, you should not be surprised that we find a peak for the First World War, a peak for the Second World War. In, in between, you find a peak also for the sec for the Great Depression, but uh, it's not too large if you compare with what happened uh, during the wars and what happened later on. After the war, you have a, a slow increase in the public debt to GDP ratio in advanced economy, which is an anomaly. And this is the first increase that, that you get without uh, a war. And it's due to a number of causes. And then, of course, more recently, you have a new pickup in public debt due to the global financial crisis. And now the public debt ratio in the average of the advanced economy, and the same applies to Italy, is with some differences, is at the highest level since uh, it was. It is at the level that was overcome only during the Second World War. So historically, there is an anomaly here. Uh, if we go and look at individual countries, we see that the countries 
several countries that were affected by uh, shocks, uh, uh, they were under the pressure of financial markets, um, like uh, Greece, like Italy, like uh, Portugal, uh, like Cyprus, like Spain, are characterized by a high level of uh, public debt. Uh, now, of course, you also find countries that have high public debt that uh, were not affected by pressures in financial markets. So they would tell you that having a high public debt ratio is a necessary condition to be in trouble but uh, uh, not a, a sufficient condition, and we'll, we'll come back to this uh, issue. Um, a, few, a couple of more charts I wanted to show you. This is uh, the, the ratio between holding of, private, of public debt by residents in percent of total public debt, and this is telling us something relatively important. The countries uh, uh, get in trouble when the ratio of holdings of public debt by residents uh, is relatively low. Italy. Spain, Portugal, Cyprus. You don't even you don't have Greece in this in this chart, but Greece also before the crisis have a, a, a high a low level of holdings by domestic residents uh, in, in its public debt about 25 uh, percent. On the contrary, you have uh, Japan, uh, which has not been under pressure for financial market recently, which has uh, the highest debt to GDP ratio and also has the highest ratio between the holdings of debt by domestic assets and total, total holdings. Uh, another chart that is interesting is this one. This is what I call, so far I've shown you the figures about uh, financial debt, the one that essentially bonds the securities sold on the market. This is a different concept. This is what I call pension and healthcare entitlement debt. This is important from a long-term perspective. What is this chart? Uh, essentially, this tells you what the, this is the net present value. So today's the sum in today's uh, pounds uh, or we should say pounds euros, pounds uh, or lira, perhaps also lira. We should say. Um, of uh, future increases in pension spending and healthcare spending. Uh, it's a, like a hidden liability for the government. Yeah. If the government has to uh, pay in the future higher and higher amounts of money for pensions, it is like a debt that the government has today. And this debt is split into components. The red component, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the red component is uh, healthcare spending. The increase in healthcare spending between now and 2050, uh, the blue component is pension spending. These liabilities, for some economies, are the only thing that matters. They are very large, 100-150% of GDP. Um, yet financial markets don't pay much attention to this. I argue many times that there is no empirical evidence that this thing has an impact on market developments. That's why, although this is in principle very important, in my book I focus mostly on financial debt, the one that we talk about every day, the one that comes to maturity every month. That's the key difference. This stuff does not come to maturity, does not need to be rolled over every month. Financial debt as a major problem, it needs to be rolled over every month, comes to maturity, it needs to be rolled over. So this is just to tell you that I will focus on this debt, this public debt to GDP ratio, and not on these forms of debt, which in principle is important, but doesn't seem to have in practice much of a relevance. Now I told you that public debt is high, it's high especially in some countries. It's like fever. Fever is high, but uh, you say the fever is high because you feel sick. Okay. So now the issue is uh, when is it that uh, public debt is so high that you feel sick, and what kind of sickness do you feel? And that's what I'm going to. Uh, what, that's what, what I'm going to turn to now. Why is public high public debt uh, a problem? Essentially, for two reasons. There is a, a high public debt that needs to be rolled over every month in the market, and uh, it leaves a country exposed to a rollover crisis. We'll come back to this in detail, but essentially the idea is that financial markets may think that your debt is so high that you are not going to repay, and 
if they start thinking this, investors don't buy government paper anymore. The second reason is that, uh, the first one is something that all economists agree about. The second one, there is uh, less agreement, but I believe there is sufficient empirical evidence to show that also the second effect is important for a number of reasons that we will explore. High public debt is like a burden on the economy, and the, bur and, and the economy moves uh, more slowly. It grows less if public debt is, is, very, is very high. There is a third reason that is sometimes quoted uh, to explain why, why high public debt uh, is bad, and, uh, but it's a sort of derivative reason. If public debt is high, the government has, less, uh, has fewer ammunitions. Uh, does not really can the government cannot really expand fiscal policy to sustain the economic activity if there is a need. Italy, for example, when it was hit by a shock in 2011, uh, 2000, 2008, 2009, the, the global crisis, could not do what other countries were doing, cutting taxes, spending more to support the economy because it, its debt was already high. I'm saying this is a derivative. It's an important reason. It is a derivative reason in the sense that uh, uh, you cannot raise public debt further because public, de uh, public debt that is too high is bad. So we need to go back to the original reasons why public debt is bad. So let's uh, explore these two uh, things. Uh, exposure to a rollover crisis. This guy, does anybody know who this guy is? Ponzi. Ponzi. Who said Ponzi? Me. OK, done. good. You get a prize. <laughs> This guy is uh, Charles Ponzi. Charles Ponzi is a legend in a negative sense in financial history. He was born in Italy, perhaps not a chance. Uh, he died in Rio de Janeiro. He is uh, the creator of the so-called Ponzi schemes. Ponzi schemes are financial schemes in which uh, I borrow money, I promise you to pay a very high interest rate. Ponzi was offering a 50% rate on a six month maturity. And for a while, I managed to pay you back because I keep, I keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. This is a Ponzi scheme. At one point, people start wondering what is there underlying this uh, business? And when people find out that there is nothing, that uh, the money comes that uh, Ponzi managed to pay was simply coming by additional borrowing, everything collapsed. Uh, and so Ponzi ended up uh, in jail after, uh, this, uh, after his scheme uh, collapsed. He spent, uh, he spent time in a uh, few years in prison uh, for, in the United States. Then he came back to Italy. He worked for uh, the... Italian airline company of uh, what would be now Alitalia. For those of you who are, for those, for, for those of you who are Italian, they know that Alitalia is in trouble at the moment. So he worked for the uh, Ala Littorio, which was uh, the Alitalia at the time. It didn't work out very well. He emigrated to uh, Brazil and he died as a poor man in 1949. But his legend uh, lives on. Uh, now, why I'm bringing on the, uh, why why am I showing uh, Ponzi here? Because uh, mark investors uh, may be afraid that governments are running a Ponzi scheme. Essentially, that uh, they borrow, they 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 are able to repay the debt coming to maturity simply by borrowing more and more. And it's a concrete uh, risk because in, in some periods. That's exactly what governments are doing. That's exactly what governments are doing. When we say that, I don't know whether you're familiar with the term primary surplus or primary deficit. That's the difference between the revenues minus the non-interest spending. So even if uh, with zero debt, with zero debt, uh, you would have some spending, of course. You would spend for, for the army, you would spend for uh, schools, for pension. The difference between, uh, and we come back to this issue, the difference between the revenues and the primary spending is the primary surplus. It's your normal income stream. The underlying activity that would allow you, the underlying resources that would allow you to pay back your debt if you have a debt and to pay interest. Now, many governments have a negative difference between revenues and primary spending. Technically, they are running a Ponzi scheme, but of course, Investors think that this is temporary. A big difference between Ponzi and governments is that 
financial market investors believe that this may be a temporary situation, but technically they are running a Ponzi scheme. When the bottom line is that when debt is very high, when markets know that uh, the interest payments are very high, markets may start wondering whether you will be able to pay you back. If, you, if I lend you money, if I borrow your bonds, uh, will you be able to pay me back? And if debt is very high, governments may decide, may prefer not to pay back people, investors. And, and, and then financial markets get extremely worried. They stop investing in government paper. If this occurs, the government stops. The government is unable to pay salaries, to unable to pay pension. There is a collapse. And at that point, it's not only the government that suffers, but it is the whole economy. It's what happens in Italy in 2011, 2012. So the question is, when is it the public debt is so high as to, so high that causes these effects? These are thresholds that are used currently by the IMF. When the public debt to GDP, for emerging markets, the, the middle income, lower income countries, then the public debt to GDP ratio, the debt as a relation to GDP, the output of the economy, is higher than 70%, the IMF says we should start being worried. For advanced economies, the threshold is 85%. At one point, uh, the fund said that uh, for advanced economy, there is an absolute threshold of 120%, after which debt is unsustainable. Unsustainable means that you need to have a debt restructure. You need to default. Now, the IMF doesn't say this anymore very often, but at one point it started saying this. Uh, now, these are not magic numbers, as you can imagine. Economics is not an exact science. But the bottom line is that uh, with the debt-to-GDP ratio, therefore, the world economy is now about 100 and, for, for advanced economy, is about <coughs> 105, 110% of GDP. And for countries like Italy, where the debt-to-GDP ratio is 130%, clearly, one can be, to one can start being concerned about the sustainability of public debt. This is uh, the famous spread, uh, sorry, the, the right there it's in Italian spread, Italian spread over Germany. This is the yield, the difference between the yield of Italian bonds and the yield of, of German bonds. As you can see, during the crisis it went up to 550 basis points. That's when it was becoming really different, difficult for the Italian government to borrow. Now it's, uh, it came down to about 100, it has started creeping up in the last year, now it has declined a bit. We are still far away from the top level, reaching 2011-2012, and, and yet public debt is much higher. So why interest rates on Italian debt and on the debt of many other countries with a lot of high public debt, uh, why the interest rate is so low? Does it show that we should not be worried about these high levels of public debt? And that the threshold that I showed you before are for some reason irrelevant? I don't think so. I think what this mystery of why this high public debt so far, in spite of what happened in 2011 and 2012, where some countries did get in trouble, why now? public debt does not seem to have a major impact on interest rate and does not seem to lead to a crisis, a lot of this has to do with what central banks are doing. Over the last few years, central banks, like the Bank of England here, the Fed in the United States, and more recently, the European Central Bank, or the Bank of Japan even more, are buying government paper like crazy, in, in a massive way. This, there has been, uh, yeah, I'm using some technical terms, a surge in uh, base money. What is base money? Essentially, base money are the pieces of paper that we keep in our pockets, banknotes, and uh, the liquidity, the money that banks have deposited at the central bank. There has been a, a, some, something unprecedented in history has happened over the last few years. This is what happened to this uh, liquidity the money the banks uh, hold in the United States, Japan, UK, and your area. There has been a surge in money printing by central banks, which has been entirely matched by the purchase of uh, government securities by central banks. So 
No wonder this surge in public debt has not caused any immediate damage, is not causing now immediate damages to the economy. It's because everything has, almost everything has been financed by, or at least a lot has been financed by central banks. So the real mystery is why not, why don't we see now uh, bad effects of high public debt? Why don't we see a crisis in Italy at the moment? It's because uh, the central bank, the European Central Bank, is buying government paper. Uh, the question is why is this, is this not having an impact on inflation? And forgive me, I will come back on this later. And the other big question is for how long this will last? It cannot last forever. At one point, this money printing, if nothing has happened, will cause uh, too much inflation, and central banks will have to mop up the liquidity they created earlier. They will start to absorb this, and by doing this, they will sell government securities to the market, and it will be at that point that the real weight of public debt will become apparent to, to everybody. So, don't be... Uh, you should remain concerned uh, by, by, uh, by the fact that public debt is so high, even if you don't see the immediate results. But even if there is no crisis like the one that some countries like Italy, Greece, Spain experienced experience in 2011-2012, there is the other problem of high public debt that it leads to lower, lower long-term GDP growth. Now, there are two economic reasons why high public debt can cause low growth. The first one is what people call crowding out. If the government borrows resources from the market, there is less money that goes to the private sector, interest rate, other things being equal, will be higher, and there will be lower investment. There will be lower private sector investment, which being the engine of growth will cause lower growth. This is a first story, it's what uh, Olivier Blanchard uh, illustrated in that article, it's what Alan Greenspan uh, illustrated in this uh, speech that he made uh, in 2001. I've long argued that uh, paying down the national debt is beneficial for the economy, it keeps interest rates lower than they otherwise would be, and frees savings to finance increases in the capital stock, thereby boosts the positive area of energy. This is the first uh, rationale for why high public debt penalizes growth. The second one goes back to David Ricardo. High public debt means that the government needs to tax people more to pay interest, and this discourages uh, investment, uh, entrepreneurs will move to another country. Now, how important are, are these two factors? There are a number of studies, but the first, uh, first uh, empirical evidence is pretty obvious. This is the growth rate of uh, per capita GDP, <coughs> actually total GDP in this one, but per capita will not change much. The growth rate of uh, GDP over the last 25 years. Uh, uh, moving from the country on the left, which is the fastest growing countries, to the country to the right, which are the lowest growing countries. And uh, the three countries with uh, the lowest growth rate over the last 25 years are Japan, Greece, and Italy. The three countries with the highest debt to GDP ratio in the other chart that I showed you at the beginning. Now, of course, one could say, well, there is a reverse causality. The economists are always very good at finding a reverse causality. Uh, reverse causality means that uh, the countries that grow less have uh, less, the government has lower revenues, and this uh, pushes up uh, public debt. So that's why, because of, to eliminate this pos possible reverse causality, you need uh, econometric techniques, uh, statistical techniques, which have been followed in a number of these studies. These are all studies that concluded that public debt moves from, the line of causality moves from high public debt to lower growth and not vice versa. With the exception of the last study, which was, uh, does not take into account this reverse causality effect, all the others try to control for this reverse causality effect and yet they found, they find that there is uh, an effect going from high public debt to lower growth. There is a more recent uh, paper by Pesaran and others, very good paper, published in the Review of Economics and Statistics, uh, which actually shows uh, the, same, uh, the same result. Now, how big are these effects? High public debt causes low growth. 
I show you the results of a study here that was done by the first, uh, I'm showing you the results of the first paper, the Kumar Wu paper. Uh, this is the relation between high public debt uh, level and GDP growth. This study would tell you, based on the estimate, econometric estimate in this study, would tell you that if you increase the debt to GDP ratio by 60 percentage points, what does it mean? Germany has a debt to GDP ratio of 70%. Italy is, uh, has a debt to GDP ratio of 130%. The difference is 60 percentage points. This study would tell you that the difference between these two countries, these two countries in terms of growth rate, is exactly 1 percentage point. 1 percentage point per year. That means that on average the Italian economy would tend to grow by 1 percent. The German economy would tend to grow by 2 percent. It's a huge difference. It means that after 10 years, the two countries differ in terms of per capita, this is all in ter per capita terms, differ in terms of per capita level of GDP by 10 percentage points. It's a huge effect. Now, there are some, some of the, stu the studies I show you have a lower impact. Uh, the one that I mentioned by Pesaren has an impact which is about half of this. But even if it were half, it's really a huge uh, difference in terms of impact on economic activity. So these are very large effects. Because of this risk, high public debt causes potentially crisis. High public debt lowers growth. We should start wondering how we should uh, lower public debt. Lowering public debt, however, is not uh, so easy. The obvious way is to cut public spending or to raise taxes. I will talk about these orthodox solutions, but as you can realize, both from an economic point of view and a political point of view, raising taxes or cutting public spending is not so easy. And that is why uh, economists and politicians have been looking for uh, shortcuts in trying to find alternative ways of lowering the public debt to GDP ratio. And so in my book talks uh, about uh, five uh, short, uh, uh, shortcuts. The first one is uh, printing money. So I, you know, governments can ask their central bank to print uh, pounds, and with that money you can pay back government, government debt. The second one is financial repression. We'll see what this means uh, more exactly. The third one is default, debt repudiation. You don't pay. You simply say, oh, sorry, I cannot pay you. The fourth one is debt mutualization, something that is being discussed quite a lot in Europe. You replace uh, Italian debt, uh, Spanish debt, uh, German debt with just one form of debt, European debt. In this way you spread uh, debt across all the countries of the EU area. And the last one is privatization. You sell the, the jewels, uh, the crown jewels. Uh, you sell your asset and with that you pay back. Now these solutions. In my view, either do not work or they are not sufficiently important. So I'm going to talk uh, rapidly about uh, some of the, about the solution, and then we're going to talk about what I call the highway, the, uh, the, the main solution, the, the more um, appropriate solution. Uh, printing money. Uh, printing money, I'll be quite uh, quick here. Uh, printing money helps uh, in two ways. Uh, First, uh, it can alleviate the effects of high public debt. It's a bit what is happening now. Uh, central banks uh, print money. The money stays in the system. It does not spill over to the rest of the economy. We'll see why this may be happening. Uh, it keeps markets quiet. It can do this or it can simply threaten to do this. And if uh, financial markets know that there is this threat, they will not uh, attack uh, a certain uh, government paper because they know that the central bank can intervene. Um, the risk of this is uh, inflation. If uh, market and inflation expectation, if market uh, realize that uh, uh, this uh, this may happen, the risk of not being repaid uh, disappears. But they realize that there is a risk of being repaid with. Uh, simply pieces of paper whose worth uh, is basically nothing. The risk is an inflation wave. Um, now, this is something that can work uh, to, as a, in the short run, uh, and it is working now. 
Then we should, however, wonder, I said that the problem with this solution is that there is a risk of creating too much inflation. And at this point, could, could somebody could say, well, but inflation is the solution to reduce public debt. And that's why we need to go to the next slide. Printing money could be a solution to the public debt problem. Why? Essentially because uh, debt, government securities, circulate now in the market. They have, most of them, they have a fixed coupon, they pay a fixed interest rate. <coughs> if there is an inflation wave, the value in terms of purchasing power of the bonds in circulation is uh, cut by inflation, by the rise inflation. I have to pay, I'm the government, I borrow 100. I need to pay you back uh, in one year 100. If in, in the meantime inflation goes up to 20%, I pay you back 100. But the value of those 100 has been cut by 20% by the inflation rate. So high inflation, particularly a surge of inflation, is a solution to the public debt problem. Um, I don't want to go in. The technicality, some of you are not uh, familiar, may not be familiar with these terms. But essentially, this slide show you that uh, uh, in normal circumstances, uh, moderate inflation, inflation of the order of 5-6% per year, would not be sufficient to reduce public debt through inflation very much. Essentially, if uh, the inflation goes up by relatively slowly, from 2% to 6%, uh, markets have time to respond. So when government securities come to maturity, they want to be paid the higher interest rates uh, than on the older mature on, on the older securities. And so uh, in order to, an inflation rate that goes up to 5% for five years cuts public debt but by not very large amounts. Uh, the, that chart on the right shows you how much uh, public debt will be cut by inflation going up to five, six percent for five years. And it's something like uh, for most countries like 10 percentage points, while public debt, as we see now, is about 110 percent. Uh, to have, uh, to use inflation to, to get rid of public debt, what you need is an inflation outburst. You need to bring inflation to 20, 25 percent for two years, and then that works. Then financial markets don't have time to react. And the, the real value of public debt, the value of public debt in real terms, is undercut, is cut down by sizable amounts. Here you bring inflation up to 20, 25% for two years, public debt declines by 30%. The problem is that um, that's also very problematic to bring inflation to 20, 25%. Uh, it's a tax, it's an inflation tax. Essentially, though, you're taxing the bondholder in this way by paying back in real terms less than what you have borrowed. Uh, the inflation genie is out of the bottle, uh, so it's difficult then once inflation is being up to 25% to bring it back to reasonable levels. And also you have seen that some countries like Turkey in the 1990s when this did not work. Inflation in Turkey was 100%. Uh, interest rates uh, rapidly moved to 130%. So. It did not work in eroding the value of public debt. Altogether, it doesn't seem to be a great idea. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I think that uh, the discussion would, uh, would be too long on this. Uh, but very, very briefly, uh, there is an additional complication for countries that are part of uh, uh, maybe we can com come back if there is time on this at the end, because it's quite interesting. But uh, there is an additional complication to following the inflation route for countries that are members of the euro area. And the, the complication is that they cannot print their own money. They cannot create inflation. That's one of the reasons why many Nobel Prize winners from the beginning said that the euro was a bad idea and they will penalize growth. But let me skip uh, this because uh, uh, it's quite uh, interesting, but um, I don't want to run out of time. If there is time, I'll come back to this chart, which are interesting also from the point of view of the future of the euro, but it's a sort of a side uh, discussion. So let's go back, let's go to the second solution to the, uh, infl to the public debt uh, puzzle, uh, financial repression. What is financial repression? This has been, as uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and, and 
and uh, Belen uh, Sblanch and argued in this paper the liquidation of government debt, uh, the financial repression solution has been used many times in the past. Uh, I told you that one of the reasons why high inflation or moderate inflation cannot erode the value of public debt is that interest rates increase when people realize that there is inflation. Uh, how about uh, putting a cap on the level of interest rate? That's financial repression. That's one form of financial repression. You introduce a law saying that interest rates cannot be higher than a certain level. Or you introduce a law saying that people cannot invest abroad, they can only invest domestically, and therefore they are forced to buy government paper. Or you can put a ceiling on the interest rate that is paid uh, by banks in which case there is less competition with respect to government paper. Financial repression has been used a lot during until uh, the 1980s. Then, because it was felt that financial repression was bad for the, ordinary for, for, the, for the orderly work of financial markets, there was a lot of deregulation. But in the past, uh, for example, after the Second World War, a good chunk of the reduction in the public debt to GDP ratio that you saw in those years happened in periods of financial repression in which there were a number of regulations that would prevent interest rates on government paper for, from increasing uh, too much. I believe at the moment something like this is happening. I told you that uh, earlier that uh, what is happening is that uh, central banks are financing uh, governments, they print money to buy government paper, this is not creating inflation, the money stays in the system. I believe it stays in the system that does not create unpleasant side effects and therefore makes this financing possible because of a form of financial repression which was not intended, I call it accidental financial repression. What is happening is that uh, very loose monetary policies were coupled with very restrictive bank supervision, bank regulation policies. After the 2008-2009 crisis, banks, uh, the, the regulations on banks, particularly the regulation on how much equity banks uh, should uh, hold, were tightened a lot because it was felt that uh, we did not want to have another financial crisis like 2008-2009. Uh, so the, cap the capital requirement for banks have increased. This is preventing banks from lending. And that's why banks are happy to sit on a lot of, or to swim in a lot of liquidity that stays there in the system, that is the product of the purchases by central banks of government paper. And this is very good for governments at the moment. Interest rates on government paper are very low. The liquidity is, uh, is there, it's not causing an inflation wave, it's not causing a depreciation wave, and, and, and governments are, get a lot of cheap money. Through this combination of uh, very loose monetary policy and tight, very tight uh, uh, regulation on, on banks. Uh, I call it accidental financial repression, it's working so far. The question is again, will it last? What we have now in the current situation is uh, that there is a lot of liquidity in the banking system. Banks are not using this liquidity, they are not lending uh, a lot to enterprises, they are not lending a lot uh, to uh, households, they are not speculating against uh, their own currency. Japan is a very good example. It's a bit like having a house where you have poured a lot of uh, gasoline on the floor, you get into the house, you say, mm, there is a strange smell here, but it's not too bad. So, And then somebody lights a match and then everything ex explodes. I'm afraid we may be in this uh, situation. So far it's lasting, but we don't know for how long uh, it will last. Sooner or later banks will be able to attract more equities. And at this point they will be able to use all this liquidity that exists uh, in the system. Take Japanese banks. Japanese banks are not speculating against the yen. They are happy to hold this liquidity in yen deposited at the central bank. They could start using it. They are repressed in a way by the uncertainty about the future, how much equity they will need in the future. There is Basel 3.5, Basel 4, these are agreements, this is the name of agreements at the international level on how much banks will have, how much capital, how much equity banks will have to hold in the future, but we don't know how long it will last. It's a precarious, uh, it's an uncertainty equilibrium.
So a, solu to a solution that repudiation. Uh, that repudiation means uh, I'm not going to, buy, to pay you back. Now, obviously, this has cost. If I don't pay you back, I lose in terms of uh, reputation. Uh, how big are the reputational costs? <coughs> the first paper argues that uh, um, markets, financial markets, have short memory. The second paper tells you that they have short memory if, uh, uh, if you pay back 90%, uh, they have short memory. If you pay back only 50%, financial markets remember very well. So it depends on the amount of the haircut. Uh, but this is something economists would agree. Uh, there is a cost. Uh, some, of, some economy will believe it's not so large, other economies believe it's larger. What I found surprising is that uh, economists did not focus much on another, uh, on another point. That repudiation is not an alternative to austerity. Even the IMF said, well, austerity is bad, uh, and therefore we don't want to penalize uh, uh, the country too much. There should be a debt uh, restructuring. Let's, have def let's default on public debt. The problem is that uh, uh, defaulting on public debt also is a tax. It's a tax on the bondholder. And if the bondholders are mostly domestic bondholders, it's a tax on your domestic economy, which also has a recessionary effect, effects like any other tax. I showed you at the beginning that, take, take Italy. Uh, Italy's uh, domestic holdings of public debt are, is about 60%. That means that 60% of the tax will be paid by domestic residents. And one could say, well, at least 40% will be paid by foreigners. It's true, but in the case of European debt, the foreigners are really just living just beyond your borders because most European debt is held in Europe. Most of Italian debt is held in Europe. And they're going, if you tax uh, your uh, uh, neighbors, there are going to be pretty large spillover effects on your own economy. Think about what happened when Greece defaulted on its debt. There was a 50% haircut. The whole European system was shocked. If Italy defaulted on its debt, Italy's uh, uh, public debt uh, is about uh, more than six times the size of Greece's, than Greece's public debt. The whole economy of the world, I mean, the, the, the economy of the whole world, will be, will be hit by this. The whole financial system of the world, we use spillover effects for Italy itself. So I don't think this is a feasible solution, at least when it was a feasible solution in the 80s, when for Latin American countries, most of that was held by North American banks, but not in the case of Europe, at least not uh, in most uh, cases. Now, we may end up in a situation in which simply markets uh, force uh, a debt restructuring because they simply stop uh, by government paper. But it's not uh, doing this strategically is not a great solution. For a solution, I'll be very fast here. Sorry, that uh, debt mutualization, I'll be very fast here. Debt mutualization means uh, that uh, we pull together public debt in the euro area and we replace the to replace the debt of individual states. This will be nice, but uh, it will not happen. <laughs> it will not happen, not because uh, Germans are bad. Uh, not fin Finnish guys are very nasty and they don't like Italians. It that will not happen because this uh, uh, requires a kind of uh, uh, altruism. Is altruism? Altruism. Right? altruism that you don't even find uh, in countries that reached a political union. In the United States, the federal government does not provide a guarantee for the debt uh, issued by California. California does not guarantee the debt issue by the state of New York. Each one is responsible for its own debt. Even in currency areas, common currency areas like the United States, which have reached a political union, you don't find this kind of altruism. Now, there are some exceptions. In the United States, after the independence war that was fought against uh, Britain, there was a debt mutualization. But that was because uh, debt of individual uh, states came from a war that had been fought in common. Can you imagine if the Germans would accept to guarantee or to take over part of the Italian debt, which they perceive to be arising from a more generous welfare system? I don't think this uh, will ever happen. So it would be nice, but it will not, it will not happen. 
Privatization is a possible solution, but there is not, uh, simply not enough to privatize it. <laughs> Again, in the case of Italy, the most optimistic estimate would tell you that over 10 years you can um, get 15% of GDP against the public debt to GDP ratio of 130% of GDP and average privatization revenue of 0.25% of GDP between 2011 and 2015. <laughs> so even if you from 0.25 you move to 1.5 a year, after 10 years you only get 15 percentage points when public debt is 133% of GDP. It can help, but it's not uh, the only possible, uh, it cannot be the main, the main uh, avenue, the, the main solution. So, the highway. The highway has two components. Structural reforms uh, to boost uh, growth, a moderate level of fiscal uh, uh, austerity. Uh, the first point I want to make is growth is extremely important to lower the public debt to GDP ratio. Here is an example, a simulation. Take a country that happens to have a debt to GDP ratio of, like Italy, 130% of GDP. If this country manages to increase uh, its growth rate by 1%, so in Italy is now growing by 1% to move it to 2%, after 15 years, the public debt to GDP ratio would have declined by almost 60 percentage points. Italy would have become Germany if it manages to grow more. Now, this is extremely good. It's very good. So, is this the solution? Not so fast. Uh, first problem: uh, How do we raise? Uh, uh, how do we boost the uh, public debt? I won't get into the details uh, of this uh, chart because some aspects are quite uh, technical. But the bottom line of this chart will tell you that first of all you should forget one thing that still many people would, uh, would argue for, which is what I call pulling yourself by one's uh, uh, bootstraps. Uh, namely, we want to reduce public debt, we need to spend more. Now it's counterintuitive, but there is a logic. You spend more. You grow more, revenues uh, increase for the government, this drives down public debt. Unfortunately, it does not work uh, uh, in this way. The plain vanilla version of this story is, uh, is, is simply wrong because the increase in spending has a temporary impact on growth, but a permanent income on the deficit. There are more complicated stories. They have, there is a left wing version of this story, of more complicated story, the right wing version of this story. The bottom line is that it doesn't seem to work. This is the logic that was followed by uh, Ronald Reagan in the 80s, and is being followed now by, by Trump. We cut taxes, the economy will jump, will increase, revenues will go up, we cut public debt. It did not work under Reagan. Under Reagan, the public debt to GDP in the United States increased from 40 to 60 percent of GDP over eight years. I, ha I would have doubt if it works with Trump. So, the re what you really would need to do to boost growth is to have structural reforms, liberalizing certain sectors. For example, in Italy there are a number of constraints, we'll come back to these constraints perhaps if we have uh, uh, time, to allow the country, the market to work uh, better in Italy, the economy to work better. You need structural reform, but structural reforms take time, there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a second problem with the chart I showed you before. This huge decline in the public debt to GDP ratio occurs for two reasons. The first one is purely arithmetical. We are talking about the public debt to GDP ratio. If GDP goes up, the ratio comes down. Unfortunately, this is not the main driver of this decline. If we relied only on this driver, this is what happen, would happen to the debt to GDP uh, ratio. After 15 years, uh, the debt to GDP ratio would have declined only by 16 points, not 60 points. The real driver of the decline in the public debt to GDP ratio is something else, is the fact that when growth goes up, uh, revenues increase for the government and if all revenues are saved, if all revenues are saved, with those revenues you can back your public debt, you can pay back your public debt. In this case, the debt to GDP ratio after 15 years declines by 60 percentage points. Now, of course, it's unrealistic to believe that if there is higher growth, 
for 15 years, all the revenues arising from uh, higher growth uh, will be saved. In this example, you start with a deficit uh, of 3% of GDP. You end up after 15 years uh, with a surplus of 3.5-4% of GDP. No, no government will be able politically to run a, a, an overall surplus of 4% of GDP for a long time. But this chart, so it's not possible to do this completely. But this chart and this reasoning tells you something important. As part of the solution, you must save some of the revenues that come from higher growth. And this is the form of fiscal austerity, some degree of fiscal austerity that is needed and could solve the problems of countries like Italy and other countries. So, Let's explore this uh, in more detail. And with the example of Italy in mind, because that's the one that I've explored more closely. A moderate level of fiscal authority, what is needed? Now, here I'm going to tell you first uh, the scenario that uh, was prepared when the book came out and in Italy. Uh, a few things happened later on, but I'll tell you first uh, this scenario. Uh, what was necessary was to freeze primary spending in real terms at the 2016 level. So, Italy is growing. Revenues are going up. The kind of austerity that is needed now is to resist the temptation to spend more if revenues go up. It's a bit like a household. The household has a lot of debt. At the beginning of January 1st or January 2nd, the household receives a salary increase. What does the household do? What, was the, what, do pe what do the people in the household do? Do they start spending? No, they save that revenue increase to pay back. They save the wage increase to pay back their debt. This is what Italy should do. It's not a form of uh, very, very harsh austerity. It's resisting the temptation to spend more when revenue go up. Uh, in the simulation that I ran uh, in early 2016, this would allow you to balance the budget by 2019, 2020. Balancing the budget means debt is not increasing in euro terms anymore. As a ratio to GDP, it starts declining because GDP uh, increases. And uh, what you would have to do after that, you just to maintain a balanced budget. In cyclically adjusted terms mean, means on average, uh, taking into account the ups and downs of, of the economy. Now this seems to me the right solution for Italy in early 2016. Between then and now, what happened is that uh, um, the Italian government decided to increase in the 2017 budget to increase the spending and also to cut some tax ratios uh, without offsetting this with uh, tax cuts. So it did not resist the temptation to cut taxes or to spend more as uh, GDP was uh, growing. So I ran again the simulations and so you now need to wait a bit longer to balance the budget. You need to wait uh, to wait until, uh, sorry, this is, uh, no actually this is still essentially the, this is still essentially the, the, the simulation I had at the time. I don't have the new charts uh, for this one, but essentially what you have now to balance the budget by 2019-2020 you would have some cuts in, in spending in the first two years. You would have to cut spend, but not by the huge amount in 2011 and 2000, uh, in 2018 and 2018. It is still feasible, you, but you cannot just freeze spending. You need to cut a bit uh, at the beginning, but not a huge amount. Uh, once you get to the balanced budget, uh, then debt will stay constant, and this is what happened. What would happen to the public debt to GDP ratio? It would decline quite slowly, quite slowly, but it would uh, decline. And as I will argue, uh, and this will be consistent, by the way, with the European rules, uh, the SGP, the SGP is the Economic Stability and Growth Pact, with the European rules. Debt will decline. Uh, uh, slowly. So two objections at this point before we move uh, to the to the end. First objection: um, doing this would require running very large, fairly large uh, primary surpluses. I mentioned to you over primary surpluses the difference between revenues and non-primary spending. Italy, for the first ten years, we had to run primary surpluses of the order of four percent of GDP. We are now at a level of about 1.5% of GDP. Uh, 
So you would need to reach a level of 4.5% and then keep it there. Would this, uh, has this ever been done? Recently, the IMF says that you know, this is impossible to do. Really, there are a number of examples here of countries. Look at the third column from the right. Countries that for several years maintain the primary surplus of the order of five, three, two, two and a half, three and a half, four percent, five percent, even seven percent of GDP for Canada for several years in order to bring down uh, public debt. So it has been done. The most interesting example is, I believe, Belgium, which between 2000, uh, between 1996 and 2007 kept the primary surplus on average of 4.4% and, and lower, sorry, 4.9% uh, and lower between 93 and 2007, sorry, and managing that period to lower the public debt to GDP ratio by 50 percentage points, as you can see in the second column. So it has been done. Um, then the next question is, um, uh, can this be done only when growth is high? Because one person say, well, you can run large primary surplus if the economy is going well. And indeed, you see that the average growth rate uh, uh, in that period, in, in, during these episodes, were quite high. It never came below 2%, as in the case of, of, of Denmark. And now it's difficult to grow by 2%. Most advanced economies are growing less than 2%. And so one could say, well, it will never happen because in the past, all cases of debt reduction were occurred at the time of growth when growth was faster. My answer is that, of course, if we go back in history in the last few decades, we see this happening only when growth was faster because growth was faster in all countries. So it's very difficult in the past to find, to find advanced countries that did not grow very fast. The real question is, is there a relationship between uh, the success in keeping high primary surpluses and the level of growth. And this chart uh, tells you that there is no positive, in, in the countries that succeeded, with the dots represent countries from the previous chart, in the countries that succeeded, there is even a negative re relationship between the level of the primary surplus and the growth rate of the economy. So it doesn't seem to be true that uh, a necessary condition to keep high public, sur uh, public uh, um, surpluses is a high growth rate of the economy. That's why I believe that Italy, without, and then the book explains why in more detail, Italy could indeed maintain its growth rate, its uh, primary surplus at the level of 4% without having an excessively penalized, uh, without being penalized too much in terms of growth rate. One last point, one last objection. I show you that the decline in the public debt ratio is, uh, is quite slow. And so one could wonder, well, is it worthwhile? The public debt is declining, but you will remain very high for several decades, for Italy, for a number of high debt countries. Um, would it uh, suffer throughout this period from those uh, uh, problems that I mentioned at the beginning, exposure to financial crisis and low growth. And my answer is that uh, there are some studies that show you that as long as public debt is declining, the bad uh, consequences for an economy uh, of having high debt are reduced a lot or even disappear. The first paper is one that we just uh, uh, completed and uh, shows you that uh, the risk of a crisis for a country whose debt to GDP ratio is declining more or less by at the same speed uh, of the previous chart, or the chart that I showed you before, is half, becomes, ha it halves with respect to a situation in which public debt is constant or even more is, uh, is increasing. So, Having a decline in public debt to GDP ratio is good news, even if public debt is, is, is high. And it's essentially because uh, crisis occurs not only when debt is, is high, but when it's high and rising. If your debt to GDP ratio is declining and there is a shock, your public debt stops declining but does not start rising. The second paper, and together with the second paper, also the paper by Pezran that I mentioned earlier, show you that uh, if public debt is declining, the bad effects on growth also disappear. Actually, this paper shows you that they disappear completely. The effects on growth disappear completely on, 
uh, if public debt is, is declining. That's why I think altogether a strategy of gradual, uh, a gradual decline in the public debt to GDP ratio can work uh, as long as we start soon enough. In Europe, particularly in Europe and elsewhere, but particularly in Europe, the moment in which interest rates uh, will start rising and the full weight of public debt will be felt on the economy is not so far away. Draghi, the Italian uh, president of the European Central Bank, will not go there in two and a half years. His mandate expires uh, at, in, in the fall of 2019. He will probably be replaced by some, uh, somebody from a Northern European countries. In any case, interest rates will be rising throughout the world uh, over the next uh, two and a half years. Italy and other European countries like Portugal, like Spain itself, like France, have to manage to reduce, must reduce their, must start reducing their public debt to GDP ratio before the interest rate shock occurs. Because if, it's, if they try to do it when interest rates rise, they, the economy will, will be hit not only by the increase in interest rate, by, 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 but also by the tightening of, of, uh, of fiscal policy. Will this happen? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a political expert, uh, but I think as an economist, my, my, my task is to tell uh, people, uh, the public opinion, has, uh, ever, as things are. It is, it is a task of politicians to do things. With this, I stop here, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.